In this chapter, we're going to do Vazicek model. It's related with binomial trees, and it's basically related to something that we're going to call the short rate process. So Vazicek at the end of the day is what's going to help us value derivatives. Suggested grading is Veronesi. So Veronesi doesn't do the same type of trees, but some methodologies are similar to the ones I present here. What are we going to do in this chapter? First, we're going to review what you know about binomial trees for stock options. So for stocks, you have seen some binomial trees. We're going to do it again to refresh your memory. And then we're going to start with binomial trees for interest rates. And that's going to help us understand first the shape of the term structure, how to manage risk with non-parallel term structure shifts. And at the end, it's going to allow us to value derivatives. These derivatives are basically options or bonds with embedded options. And the model is going to be a model for the short-term interest rate. So you can imagine like we are going to have a model for the one-day interest rate. Binomial trees, you can uh, do a revision. You can go to chapter 11 on Hall's book. First, let's answer the question of why do we use binomial trees? So binomial trees are used to be able to price options. So in a second, we'll get to what options are. But the whole idea is an option depends on an underlying security. So normally you have that the underlying is a stock. In this class, we'll have as underlying a bond, and actually it's going to be an interest rate. But let's imagine that it's a stock. So the thing we do is we kind of play God. Play God in what sense? In the sense that we start at t equals zero with a price, S, that say equals to 100. And then we want to know in at maturity of this option, a capital T, all the possible S's that you can have. So here basically you end up with S capital T. And here you want to have a distribution of your potential S capital T's. These are going to be given by your tree. So let's say the maximum is at 200. The minimum is like 50. And then given all these potential prices that the stock price can take at the maturity of the option, you're going to be able to know all the potential prices that your option is going to have at capital T. And then what you end up doing is you end up, what I'm going to call here, do a smart discounting. Because it's not pure discounting. It's some smart discounting where you take into account some probabilities. You take into account the fact that there can be, there can be no arbitrage opportunities and so on. And then you start moving back in your tree until you get to time zero. And then at time zero, you can say, look, my option price is this much. Another way of taking this is given that you know all the potential option prices that you can have at the treaty, you take some expected value of all these option prices at capital T, you discount them, e to the minus RT, and then that's what's going to give you your option price. So let's imagine this scenario where you have a stock price at time t equals zero, that is equal to 20. And then three months later, the price can go up to 22 or can go down to 18. We're going to have a call option. So what is a call option? So options have basically two types, calls and puts. The one I like the most are puts. A put is something that is going to provide you insurance in case that things go bad. So normally the payoff looks like this. And here you have some strike price. So the way I like to explain this is imagine that you have a car and that you buy insurance for your car. So and then you say when you go and buy insurance for your car, you say how much you want to insure for your car. And normally the insurance is going to be for 100% of the value of the car. Let's say in this case, this K would be the value of your car. And then every month or every year, depending on your insurance, you have to go and pay a premium for this insurance. This car, let's say it costs you 100,000 pesos. So then we're here at 100,000 pesos. So then if nothing happens to your car, basically it's this range. So basically if the car, this is the, the price of the car, if the price of the car increases, this thing is not going to pay you anything. But now let's imagine that your car gets stolen. And here is car is stolen. So if the car is stolen, basically you lose all the value of your car. So what you have in your hands now is something that's worth zero. You know, you, you get out of your house, you see, you don't see your car, 
So then you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So that's when you're going to use your insurance or you're going to exercise your put option. So then in that precise moment, the put option pays you this 100000 and then you're going to recover all the price of your car. Now, this thing is continuous. So let's say that, you know, you got into a car accident and then now the car is worth 50,000 pesos. So now instead of 100,000 pesos, you're going to receive half of it. So you're going to receive just the 50,000 to recover the price of your car. So that money is an insurance that covers you from, from bad events. In real life or in the financial markets, put options so let's say a put option. So there's a put option on the S&P 500. So basically, when there's a, a crash in the market, then you're going to get paid. On average, you always lose money because you're always paying this premium. But in bad times, you get a positive cash flow. Call options are exactly the opposite. So call options is an instrument that it's going to pay in good times. Payoff is negative and then gets positive. And basically, why would people use this? Well, people say, let's say you expect the stock price of a certain firm to go up. So instead of buying the stock itself, just you're going to say, oh, I'm going to buy instead the option. This option is going to be like super cheap. Like normally options is about like one or two percent of the stock price, depending on volatility. And then you're going to have access to this payoff, which is going to be very big. Now in options, you can make a lot of money. You can lose a lot of money. But that's the basic basic principle. Now, this payoff depends on K and S. And the payoff is basically the maximum between S at maturity minus K, which is predetermined at inception when you buy the contract, or zero. That's what you're going to get paid. So this accounts here for the premium, what you pay for that. But at maturity, you're only going to be paid zero. So at maturity, that's why I draw it like this. So this would be zero. And then here you start making money. And is this difference ST minus K. In our example, we have a three month call option that has a strike price of 21. So basically, the payoff is going to be the max between S capital T minus 21. In the upper scenario, stock price is 22. Hence, the option price is one. In the down scenario, since it's lower than 21, then the option price is going to be zero. So then the whole question is, given that we know this at t equals three months, then what is going to be the option price? And this is going to be maybe one of the most amazing things. That's one of the things I like the best to explain because I think it's amazing that they were able to get this rationale to be able to get this option price. And this actually was the work of Black, Scholes, and Merton, who received the Nobel Prize in the 90s. For this, for what I'm explaining now. So what is exactly what we're going to do? The whole idea that Black, Scholes, Merton came up with to price this option is to have a portfolio that involves stock price and the option price where you're indifferent whether the stock price goes up or it goes down. So basically what they want to do is to buy Delta shares of the stock and they want to short the option. So if you do that for the offer scenario, you're going to end up with 22 delta minus 1. And if you do that for the down scenario, you're going to end up with 18 delta minus 0. And what you want is that those two values are exactly the same. That if you go up or down, you get exactly the same value. If you solve for delta, you're going to find that delta is equal to 0 0.25. So let's wake up what we're doing. We're basically setting up a riskless portfolio that goes long shares of the stock and short one call option. This is the upper scenario, this is the lower scenario, and then we want that these two portfolios have exactly the same price. We solve for delta and we find that delta is equal to 0 0.25. Now in the riskless portfolio where you go long this delta shares which, which is 0 0.25 and short one call option, then the value in three months is going to be the 22 which was the value in the upper scenario. So it's going to be 22 times 0 0.25 minus 1. Or also it could be 18 times 0 0.25. In both cases, you're going to find that this is equal to 4.5. Now, given a risk-free rate of 12%, we are going to discount 4.5. We have here a risk-free rate of 12%. Here is time 0. Here is It would be 3 months over 12 since the rate is yearly, or this is actually 0 0.25. So then the price at time t equals zero is going to be 4.5 e to the minus 12% times 0 
and this is going to give us 4.3670. So this is the value of the portfolio at t equals zero, but we still don't know what we're looking for, which is the option price. So now the question, okay, what is the option price? So I have the stock price, but I don't have the option price. How am I going to solve it? Since at t equals zero, the price of the stock is 20 and I bought 0 0.25 shares of it, then my portfolio at time zero is going to be 20 times 0 0.25 minus the option price is going to be equal to the 4.367. So I solve here for option price and then I'm going to find that this option price is equal to 0 0.633. So this is actually beautiful because we found a way of computing the option price without probabilities, without like anything but a riskless portfolio. We replicated the option with just the stock and the bond. We didn't need anything else. Now we're going to generalize this. So we're going to say at time S0, this is the price. This is the price up. This is the price down for the stock. And F is going to be our derivative that we consider it was the call option. And this is the price of the call option in the upper scenario, and this is in the down scenario, t months later. Now, our riskless portfolio is going to be this one in the upper scenario, this one in the down scenario. So this is S0u for up, S0d for down times delta. So then I'm going to solve for delta, and it's going to find that the delta that is going to make these two portfolios to have the same value in time capital T is going to be equal to this. It's going to be a function of the option price up down and the stock price up down. Since we know that the value of the portfolio at time t is this one, then we discount it to get it at time zero. And we know that at time zero, this is the number of stocks we have at zero times delta, and this is the price of the option. So now we're going to solve for f, which is our unknown, and this is what we find. Now, this is the price of the option at time zero. So it's a function of delta and stock price and the option prices at time t. Now delta is defined this way. So we're going to replace delta in here and we're going to do some magic. So what's going to be the magic? We're going to rewrite this whole thing, this f, as follows. So we can rewrite it as f is going to be at p, which is a probability, quote unquote probability, of the price going up times one minus p and the price of the option going down. And then we multiply that by the discount factor. So what is p? p is defined this way. So you would say, why didn't we start by this? Why didn't we write it this way? Well, but remember that this was a mathematical trick. This p is not really a probability. This p is actually what they call a risk neutral probability. Why is it risk neutral? Remember that the way we got this f price was by using a riskless portfolio. So in that world where we define that riskless portfolio is that we find this p. So that's the reason they call this p a risk neutral probability. Now if we take this p as probability we can rewrite our whole problem this way where we have probability of going up and probability of going down on all our prices. In this world the expected stock price at time capital T is S0 ERT. So you're like, what? I mean, this is not true, right? You don't take a stock price and you say at time zero, you say, oh, at time capital T is S0 E to the RT. I mean, this is, this is a bond and this is not a stock price. But that's exactly the point. In this world that we have defined, in this risk neutral world, that is the future price of your stock. This is what we call the risk neutral world and binomial trees illustrate this general result that the value of a derivative is assumed to have an expected return on the underlying asset which is equal to the risk-free rate. So basically everything in this world depends also on the risk-free rate. That's the other reason it's called risk neutral valuation. Now we go back to our example where we had the 22 price are going up and down, the call option one in zero, and then we compute our P, our risk neutral probability of going up is 0 0.6523. We replace in our formula and we're gonna get that our option price is gonna be equal to our 0 0.633. Now note that the expected return of the stock is irrelevant. We haven't used it at all. We even have like computed any probability per se of what could happen in the real world. Like, so real world probabilities are also irrelevant. Now let's turn into an example that 
it has two steps. So now our tree is going to have two steps. This is going to be time zero. This is going to be time t equals three months. And then this is going to be time t equals six months. And we're going to have a call option with a strike of 21 and an interest rate of 12. I reproduced that tree in here. So k is equal to 21. That means the payoff is going to be the maximum between s capital t minus k. Now the option is going to expire here at six months. So then max is t minus k. And this one is going to be 3.2. And this one, since it's lower than 21, zero, and then this one is also zero. So now the idea is we have to come back here to get our price. So I'm gonna call this C2, this one I'm gonna call it C1, and this one I'm gonna call it C0. What am I gonna use for that? I'm gonna use this equation. So let's compute C2 first. So using this equation, C2 would be equal to P. So we had already computed P, which was 0.6523. So then we're going to replace that p times a few, which would be 3.2 plus 1 minus p times 0. And then we're going to discount this to the e minus. So in this case, r is going to be 12% and t is going to be 3 months, which would be 3 over 12. And then for c2, you're going to obtain 2.0257. c1 is going to be very easy to compute. So since these two are zero, so we're going to put here zero and zero. So C1 is going to be zero. And then C is going to be equal to probability again, which is going to be the same in this case, times 2.0257. So we're computing here this C0. So it's, we're going to use C2 and C1 and the probability. So P times 2.0257 plus 1 minus P times 0. And then here E to the minus 12% times 6 over 12. And then we're going to find that C0 is equal to 1.2823. What did we do here? We first went to the maturity of the option, which was the six months. We used, we needed to have our tree for the stock price. Then we computed the value of our option price at maturity. And then we started moving backwards in the tree from six months to three months, and then from three months to time zero. And then the goal was here to get the price at times t equals zero, which we actually got. This is the summary of that tree and the procedure we did there with the same result. You can find this in Hall's book. Trees, to be more realistic, they, have, they need to have more steps. In real life, I tried it myself, and you need at least 30 steps to have consistent results. And these trees are something that is called recombining. Recombining means that when going down and up is the same thing than going up and down. Like you come in the two cases to the same price. So this is very, very convenient because it makes your tree very tractable. Now, when it's not recombining in terms of programming and space and everything and time, it's very, very uh, consuming and very easy to I don't know if get mistaken, but these trees are much, much easier to work with. The whole idea here would be to have H that is very small. What is H? H is basically you have your time period from zero to maturity. And basically, you want to cut this in many parts. And these are going to be the steps of your tree. So here I'm making it small, but this is so that you understand like what is that I'm, that I'm doing. So anyways, and each step is going to be a tiny space in time. Now, for small h, you're going to have many time periods and many possible prices at the final date. And this is going to make sure that the binomial tree is going to be a realistic expression of the real world. So this concludes our revision on how binomial trees behave for stock prices and how you price options on stocks.